showed it to my mom. My dad was the one that kind of like drove me to all like my practices and stuff like that. I showed it to my mom. No joke, my mom's like, I didn't know you were that good. <laughs> I ran into the secretary of the FA, the Football Association in St. Kitts, and he's like, you play football? You have to work, you have to fight for your spot. And uh, my whole career has been like that. You got to fight for your spot. And I always say goalkeepers can't have a bad game. You have to be able to make those tough calls, that, those unorthodox calls. And I have to step up as a player and tell the coach to step aside. From the outside looking in, it's, I look crazy, right? Cares so. like LeBron James on the pitch, though, you know? <laughs> I know, right? <laughs> oh, no, no, no. <laughs> like LeBron and Ty Lue over here. No, okay. no, no. You got to do what you got to do, man. Welcome to the Generation Hustle Podcast, a show that explores the world of business, entrepreneurship, and important questions such as, do you say soccer or football? I'm your co-host, Sherison, alongside my good friend, Amin, and today we have the pleasure of speaking with Kira Dickinson, pro footballer or soccer player, depending on where you're listening from, and CEO of Persimmon Group. Kira is a Canadian-born footballer who started from Toronto clubs and took her talents to Howard University in Washington to pursue athletics and health sciences. Though she had no intention of a pro career, she was quickly noticed by the national team from St. Kitts and Nevis and brought on board as her goalkeeper and captain. Today, Kira serves as the CEO for healthcare consulting firm Persimmon Group, while continuing to train and educate young athletes as a mentor and coach. So we sit down with Kira to discuss her journey through athletics and healthcare, the culture shock of playing abroad and the mentality of athletes representing their country. This was a great conversation that motivated us to get out of our seats, so we hope you enjoy it too. Kira, thank you so much. So you're currently uh, the goalkeeper for Masters FA in Toronto and the goalkeeper for the St. Kitts and Nevis women's national team. Mm-hmm. Um, so that it's is... It's Nevis, by the way. Nevis. Nevis. Yes. <laughs> Sorry about that. Let's kind of just start from the beginning. This is an amazing track record. So can you walk us through your journey thus far, kind of how you got involved with soccer um, or just sports as a whole? Well... I'm 27 now. So I started playing when I was six um, and I have three older brothers. So, you know, they all played. And so it was just kind of like the thing to do yeah. for me. Um, so yeah, I started playing when I was six and, you know, I grew up playing in Brampton for like the clubs and stuff like that. To be honest, like none of my brothers like got a scholarship or anything like that. Like we all went to school, but we all went to school here. Right. But when I was in high school, I was just like, you know, it was fine. It was something to do, but I was good. Um, but I didn't realize, like, you know, how good I was. And because I played, I was played club soccer till I was about maybe 15 or so. And then I went to the academy on the East End. And then the coach there was like, you know, like here, like, you know, you can, you can do this if you want. But he would tell you that I was lazy and I was, I'm a goalkeeper. So I didn't want to dive and all this stuff. <laughs> And so um, we had a showcase uh, just within the academy and like we had a couple coaches from the U.S. come up and the Howard University coach saw me and I didn't know what Howard was. I had kind of written off the idea of playing, you know, for a scholarship and pro and all that stuff. But like he kind of came to me with like an offer and I was like, OK, like when that money's yeah, and that was money's on the table. You, you kind of really can't really say no. Yeah, and I, yeah. I, um, I showed it to my mom. My dad was the one that kind of like drove me to all like my practices and stuff like that. I showed it to my mom. No joke. My mom's like, I didn't know you were that good. <laughs> <laughs> that was their first reaction. So yeah, I went off to school there and then I came back, went over to Sweden for a bit, played for the national team and, you know, got little looks other places, but I never really pursued those um, just because I wasn't super young anymore. So in terms of like monetarily, like it didn't really make sense Mm -hmm. to kind of uproot my life and go start somewhere else. For sure. So like you never even had uh, like you never thought of it as something that you wanted to pursue professionally then. It just kind of came to you. Yeah, pretty much. Was Howard University the moment when you were kind of like, hey, let's uh, maybe start pursuing this a bit more seriously or. Honestly, not even. Yeah. Not even. I I did my four years and I did well and, you know, got a few accolades and stuff. But after that, I didn't even really see myself going beyond that. Mm -hmm. Um, But to my (laughs) to my surprise, I did. Yeah. What did you end up studying at school? 
Um, I did, so at Howard, I did my bachelor's uh, in health sciences. And then I was back for a year, back in Canada for a year. And then I went out to Vancouver, hence my funky phone number. Yeah. <laughs> and I went out to Vancouver and uh, went to UBC and I did my master's uh, in kin for a year and finished that in a year. And then, yeah. When you first got noticed by the national team, uh, can you tell us about that? Like, uh, between Howard and the national team? Because you mentioned to me when we first talked, you were like, I wasn't even looking for it. They found me. So can you kind of tell us what happened there? Well, so like my family is like from there, right? So I have like we usually for Christmas time, like we'll go down and um, that's our carnival season. So it's just like a big party pretty much. Right. Mm-hmm. So I was down there for one Christmas and we went to like one of the events and then you know, you just meet people because it's a small island. Everyone knows everybody. And I have family there. So just being with them, I meet other people. And I ran into the secretary right. of the FA, the Football Association in St. Kitts. And yeah, he just, he kind of looked again, like, you know, you're in party mode and all that. And he's like, you play football? Like in a very strange tone. Um, I feel and- like you're being nice there. Yeah, <laughs> a little bit. Um, so he didn't really believe that I played football because I didn't look like at the time that I played football. So that's how they first got my got uh, heat of me. And then, uh, yeah, just kind of came from there. They reached out a little bit later and it's been off to the races since. For sure. Does any of this feel surreal at all? Like you're very nonchalant about this. So I'm, and, and to us, it's like, wow, this is such a cool step up through each kind of, uh, kind yeah. of, kind of yeah. level of play. But for you, you're like, yeah, it just kind of yeah, came for, to me. Yeah, for me, I, I used to play goal, uh, goalkeeper in Brand, the Branton Academy as well. So I mean, as I don't know, I guess as as guys, we always uh, pursue we like we want to play professionally. You know what I mean? Um, yeah. And it's just like, oh shit, I, I'm probably not as good as I thought I was. <laughs> <laughs> Where uh, what you're describing is kind of the opposite. You didn't know how good you actually were. Honestly, it was just, now that I look back, I guess, yeah. Um, it was, it is a little surreal. Like, and even now, like when I talk about this stuff with people or people ask, um, they're like, wow, like just wow. And then I look back and I'm just like, yeah, like I'm lucky, right? Like I'm very lucky. Granted, tons of hard work. Like, don't get me wrong. Um, but it's just kind of a an homage to the the saying, um, hard work pays off, right? In any way, shape, or form, it it really does pay off. Like what you get in, what you put out, or you get out what you put in. There you go. <laughs> yeah. So with your first kind of game at the national stage, playing for the St. Kitts team, um, can you walk us through like the lead up towards that? Was that how was that feeling for you? <laughs> I'm trying to get to a point like where I'm trying to understand the emotional experience of this because yeah. you're, you're very like even keel about it. Yeah. Um, it's definitely nerve wracking. Right. I'll tell you that. Um, and for me, it was, it was different in the sense that like you look at, okay, you look at a team like Canada and the U S and England and stuff, and they're constantly in rotation of new players, young players, all that stuff. But with St. Kitts, a little bit different just because they, it's such a small island. Right. Um, that they have like their core, you know, they have their core group of players. So, me, especially coming in as a goalkeeper where there's only one on the field, mm-hmm, right. it, was, it was different for me and it was nerve wracking. And obviously, like, what if I don't play and all this stuff? Like, I'm the new kid on, on the block, like stuff like that. But, you know, I went in and again, you, you have to work, you have to fight for your spot. And uh, my whole career has been like that. You got to fight for your spot. So yeah, definitely nerve wracking. Um, but again, it's like I, I've been doing it since I was six. So at the end of the day, it kind of boils down to this isn't anything different. It's like breathing. It's like walking. It's like riding a bike for for me, for someone like me. Um, so you kind of just tap into that mentality after like all the nerves and butterflies and throwing up and all that stuff. Yeah, passes and you kind of you kind of just go out there and you get the job done. And I always say goalkeepers can't have a bad game. So you have to be mentally you have to be mentally strong enough to, you know, put all the emotions aside and and just get the job done. Yeah, and you mentioned just one thing there uh, that you had to earn your spot. Um, 
did you like was that a struggle as you when you first came to the team or like how how was that interaction with the team and kind of earning your 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 spot there it was good it was good i mean everyone is welcoming and i mean like i said like that's where i'm from so it was in, in terms of like the people and the personnel and the culture and stuff not a big deal right um but yeah and but you get a lot of pressure from even outside like the fans and and the just the island as a whole but yeah i mean again like the ball doesn't lie right so you go through you do what you have to do if you're good enough you're good enough if you're not good enough you're not good enough um but i was lucky enough and i guess talented enough to to be good enough to earn my spot and so i did for sure was there anyone on the team that kind of uh helped you uh get acquainted to it or kind of get used to that feeling of being there um there was a I mean, I was eased into it because, you know, we have camps and stuff like that. But yeah, for sure. Like during camps and, and whatever, you you kind of take to certain people and some people take to you and you have existing leaders on the team um, where it's, you know, their role and their personality to kind of make you feel comfortable and stuff. So for sure, they were all very, very welcoming. And um, from, you know, players to staff to uh, board members, like fans, every everyone was very, very welcoming. Yeah, I would imagine like playing at that level and having just uh, kind of that camaraderie around you is, is is important just to kind of first get your nerves under control, but also just uh, enjoy the experience as you're doing it as well. Because I feel mm -hmm. like representing your country is such a huge, that's such a huge feat. And that's something that not everyone can experience at that at that level or at that mm -hmm. stage. Yeah. Yeah. One fun question I have is, uh, are St. Kitts fans better than Canadian fans? Because I know <laughs> soccer is... <laughs> I know soccer, soccer is not as popular in Canada, probably, as other countries. Uh, St. Kitts fans are hardcore. Mm -hmm. And if you, can I curse on here? Yeah. Oh, yeah. If you fuck up, they'll let you know. <laughs> so. Canadians are probably just going to say, sorry, you suck. But, you know, <laughs> yeah. they always have to say sorry, but, yeah. you know. You always, I mean, if you fuck up, they'll, they'll let you know. Okay. No, yeah. that's awesome. I, I, You know, it's always cool to see, like, you know, even small island uh, countries, they're they're so serious about a sport, and it's just like a culture almost. Yeah. Um, it's like almost hockey here, right? So I would say, is that like a national sport down there, or? Yeah, I or don't even. I, or, to be yeah. honest, I don't, I don't even know. But it is one of the the biggest sports next to cricket. They love cricket, um, and we're in the islands, so right. yeah. Okay, that's awesome. So let's take a step back and I like, actually walk through mentorship. I know you just mentioned about, you know, individuals on the team that helped you down um, and including your dad throughout, you know, your early days. So how important has mentorship been throughout your career? And can you tell us like one story that sticks out um, in terms of uh, <laughs> mentorship and how you've, uh, how that allowed you to tackle challenges moving forward? For me, I guess it wasn't really a lot of mentorship in terms of one person that I guess I looked up to that, you know, had a similar, a journey that I, that I wanted. Mm -hmm. Right. For me, it was more so, especially when I took that leap to, to my Academy, to master's football. I think that was it for me because coach was awesome. Players were awesome. And yeah, I was training at such a high level right. um, with men and women um, like playing with, uh, the players that had played on the national team, men, uh, like men, when I was like 15, 16 years old. So playing at that level, I wouldn't even say that it was just, it was mentorship because it wasn't that. I never really had or knew any, other than Serena Williams, I've always loved her since I was yeah. a kid. I'm like, she's awesome. She's an awesome athlete, but I've never really had like that footballer, that female footballer to look up to. Um, instead for me, it's just been like, I've been surrounded by such great players just in general, male, female, young, old. Um, and, you know, my parents and my brothers and stuff. And I've just been surrounded by that. And that's kind of what pushed me. Right. That is really what pushed me. Because I, like I said, I didn't really know how good I was and, you know, how far I could go and all that stuff. But, you know, I had the people to push me. And I kind of just, again, it's it's such a mental sport and position. Um, right. Once you kind of tap into that, impossible to switch off. Yeah. Have you had any young, like younger players uh, reach out to you and uh, perhaps, you know, you provide that mentorship that you may not have had early on through your career? Yeah, for sure. I actually just got a call yesterday um, from a young player in St. Kitts. Um, <clears throat> she's looking to, you know, go to that next level. 
Mm -hmm. Um, and for me, like now I coach, um, I think I had mentioned that to Sheriston, but, um, I coach now in Brampton and I coach a couple teams and girls from 11, 12 years old up to like 15 years old. Yeah. That's that age, you know, and, um, I think it's very important to just kind of have that, that female, uh, role, um, Granted, I'm not the most experienced. I have, don't have the most exposure. There are always going to be people that have done more than you. Mm-hmm. Um, but to see someone that has that has made it to that stage and and played on that in that platform and and stuff, it kind of makes them feel like you know it it's possible. It's doable, right? Right? Yeah. So you um, just... Yeah. Someone regular, like I'm a regular girl, right? Right. Someone regular like me, it's doable. If right. You right. Work. Yeah. Anything. Anything is possible. Yeah. So you just mentioned you coach as well now. Um, so obviously there's an aspect of leadership that has to exist when it comes to coaching and mentorship. So what kind of characteristics do you think that a great leader should uh, kind of uh, embellish? And is it universal for you in terms of any field? Like, should that great leader be able to translate from like sports to business or to whatever ever everyday life? That's a that's a loaded question. <laughs> Um, I think a leader first and foremost has to be fearless. Mm-hmm. Um, and even a little bit crazy Yeah, to be yeah. Honest, because you have to be able to make those tough calls that those unorthodox calls and, and stuff like that. And even for myself, I know I've done that in my career and being a captain as well. I was captain for St. Kitts and Nevis, captain at Howard university, um, so I've had to do that. I've had to, I've been in situations where I have to step up as a player and tell the coach to step aside. Right. 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 But from the outside looking in, it's, I look crazy. Right. But it's, you kind of have to have the best interest. You just have, do have to have a big heart. You have to be empathetic and all those good things. But I really do think you have to be fearless. Right? How do you manage your relationship with the coach after a situation like that? Um. Again, I've done it not in a not in a um, in a rude or anything manner, but like if for me, in my role as a goalkeeper, as a captain, if I know that I see something, I'll put it into context. So like we were running, we had a session, and um, it just wasn't going well. It was not going well. We just we could not execute. This was in university. We could not execute for the life of us. And I was in the universe. It may have, it may have been national team. I think it was national team. Actually, it was national team. It was. Okay. We were in camp, and it just was not going well. We could not execute. I'm pretty sure we had a, day, a game the next day, and I, I know I was frustrated. And the coach kept stopping us, and he you could tell he was getting frustrated. So I just said, I said, just leave us. I said leave us. I brought the girls together, and we had a little pep talk, whatever. But I'm the one that had to stop practice. Mm-hmm. Right. And we recuperated five minutes. We got what we needed to do done. Practice was over. Yeah. Right? So it's just stuff like that. Again, it's not in any rude kind of way. And it's at the yeah. in hindsight, looking back in the moment, the coach might be a little bit, you know, in question of what I'm doing. But once they see the result, then, you know, it doesn't it doesn't hurt the relationship at all. Right. Right. Cares so. like LeBron James on the pitch, though. You know, <laughs> I know, right? <laughs> oh no, no, no. <laughs> like LeBron and Ty Lue over here. But no, okay. no, no. You got to do what you got to do, man. You really yeah. do. No, that's awesome. That's awesome. So, uh, one of the things that's always fascinated to us, uh, as I guess more regular individuals, we don't really see the day in the life of an athlete. We only see like the superficial kind of, you know, they play, they play on the pitch or they play the game, um, and a lot, lot of them obviously live certain lives. But let's actually go through your kind of daily routine. How did you actually prepare for like game day? And like, what was your kind of routine before that? So. Don't tell us you well, just like try. left the party with <laughs> the game. <laughs> like, <laughs> Drink a bottle of vodka before the game. No, everyone has their own little, little thing. But for me, my thing was um, I would wash my hair the day before a game. Right. Um. And, you know, get up in the morning and, you know, you, you look good, you feel good, you play good. So, you know, going to games, you would always, and this goes kind of across the board. You, you know, you put on nice sneakers and you put on some music and stuff. I know for me, music was important because I would put it in and I would zone out. But the game has always started about a day or two before the actual whistle blows. Um, I like so, that. yeah, it, for, for me, it started and I can't speak for anyone else. So I would, you know, watch videos, even highlights of myself and game footage and other professional teams and all that. 
So I would do that days, at least two days before a match. Uh, but yeah, game day, just music, 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 music. Get in the change room. I do this weird thing, but it stretches me out. I would just go right up against the wall. Yeah. Put my legs flat against the wall, and I would just lean forward and just hang. Okay. And just hang um, with my music. And no, ever, everyone knows when I'm in that position. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Don't bother me. Don't talk to me. I'll be there for a few minutes. Just don't talk to me. Um, yeah, just just music, really. Right. I usually... I usually give like a pep talk to the to the girls or the starters or whatever. Um, I have a couple little odd things that I would do on the field, like once I get in between the pipes. But yeah, um, other than that, nothing like super weird, I guess. <laughs> right, right. I think I also wanted to know, like um, athletes have evolved in terms of, you know, their diet and nutrition over the years with a lot of research and, you know, application of, you know, different treatments and stuff like that. What was your approach in terms of taking care of your body in terms of making sure there's longevity uh, in terms of the sport that you play in? Um, in terms of diet, mm-hmm. honestly, nothing crazy. I, I eat healthy anyways. Um, but before before camps and stuff, I would make sure that um, I'm carb loaded Okay. Uh, because we're training maybe two, three times a day. Okay. And depending on where camp is, if it's somewhere hot, you know, you need to make sure that you're you're hydrated as well. So that's something that's that has to happen for weeks in advance. Um, and I know before competition, um, like for example, if I'm here uh, in Toronto and I'm competing somewhere else. Like before I leave, a couple weeks before I leave here, I'll go in a deficit just to get down to a playing weight, a certain playing weight. Um, that I feel feel comfortable at um, and then go into camp and then that way I, I'm able to eat what I need to eat to perform during training sessions and tr- during games and, and all that stuff but I'll make sure I'm at my playing weight before right. and then just it, from then it's me it's me yeah, yeah. Uh, what about what's your favorite cheat meal we always love to ask athletes that. <laughs> my favorite cheat meal I won't lie I love poutine Okay, Very staying Canadian. like true to your roots. I love, <laughs> I yeah. love a poutine. I love a poutine. So you mentioned there, obviously, you have a science background with kinesiology as well. Um, mm-hmm. So that's kind of what I wanted to get to in terms of everything that you're doing outside of the sport. With your mom, you actually launched a healthcare consulting company, Persimmon mm-hmm. Group. So can you tell us about that? How did you guys come to launch this venture and um, kind of the background behind this? Um, <clears throat> well, we started in 2016. Uh, so we both worked for a, uh, a company, a pharmaceutical company, um, but that was kind of, you know, like on the fritz and going down on under. Um, <clears throat> they were being acquired by a, a bigger company, kind of like Big Fish, Little Fish. Mm-hmm. And so, you know, just keep the ball rolling. We both loved it. So we just like, okay, screw it. You know, I work for someone else. Yeah. Right. So we just we started it, and we started it when I was home for that year between Howard and going off to Vancouver to UBC. Okay. And so we launched it there. So she did a lot of because I was already doing my master's, like I would help out here and there, but she did a lot of like the legwork, just the foundation. And so once I graduated there, and I played in Sweden, I came back, and it just took off from there. You mentioned to me earlier that it was kind of like the middleman between distributors. Um, and pharmacy chains um so manufacturers you... yeah manufacturers so, okay yeah so basically just in simple terms so we have manufacturers all over the world they make great products wonderful products and they want to market it in canada and we make that happen working closely with health canada and to meet all the regulations and the good manufacturing practices and stuff like that we do all of that that middleman work to get the product mm-hmm. here on the shelves in canada for people like you for sure. So um, kind of being an athlete as well and kind of working in this space, like which do you, what are you leaning towards in terms of where you would want to be long term? Like obviously you can't be an athlete for the rest of your life, but I mean like what? working in the soccer, like with soccer or would you rather work with uh, healthcare? No, healthcare. I, I mean, a little bit of both, just in terms of monetarily Fair. healthcare, but I, I, right. I, I, I would I would. I will always be involved in football, mm-hmm. no doubt, right. to some extent. 
Um, I don't see that going away anytime soon. I don't see myself really stopping playing anytime right. soon at, yeah. at any level. Yeah. I don't play for a week and my feet itch. Yeah. So, <laughs> um, yeah, I would say just long term, I would say in terms of, you know, career wise, definitely healthcare. Yeah. Um, but definitely football to some capacity. I'd go crazy with that. <laughs> just kind of looking at maybe a lot bigger topic now here. Um, in 2020, we've seen a lot of like political change, uh, specifically around movements like Black Lives Matter. And we've seen athletes step up, um, obviously, to kind of, um, you know, portray that message out and make sure that message is important. Uh, so as an athlete yourself, do you say like there's external pressure on making these kind of ideals kind of a spread? Or is it something personal to you where you feel like you should be stepping up and talking about these things? Honestly, no, I, I haven't received any external pressure from anybody to voice on anything. Mm -hmm. um, and I support it completely. Um, but I mean, as Sheriston knows, I, uh, I just, it was overwhelming right. for me. It was overwhelming for me. And again, having gone to school in the U.S. and having a lot of my core friends being American and down there, um, like I heard all about it and it just got overwhelming. So yeah. it was I checked out from it. Right. Describe the, like a lot of us, like as Canadians always talk, you know, shit about America and yeah. what happens, but like, talk to us about the actual core differences in the culture. Like you actually have seen it. We're kind of sheltered in Canada. We don't really see it. We have healthcare. We have all that kind of stuff, but like d describe what do you mean by like that culture shock? Like what specifically kind of you went there and you're like, what the fuck is going on here? <laughs> <laughs> You're going to get me in trouble. <laughs> um, I'm not sending this link to anybody. <laughs> um, For the record, Kira is like off all of social media right now. So yeah, I'm like off the grid. If you don't have my number, forget it. Or LinkedIn, apparently, <laughs> which I don't even control. Um, in terms of like a culture shock, what I say, um, being as blunt and matter of fact as possible, I have never been around so many black people in my life. Put in very simple terms. Yeah. Okay. And again, love my people and all that, but it was just not how I grew up. Right. right. So, I mean, being immersed in that and not only that, people with the same color skin as me, just, just, I, I, don't, I don't even, honestly, I got to take you all to like a Howard homecoming or something. So you understand, but it's just, the culture is so different. They're mm -hmm. so rich in history. So you're on a campus with people that have been dying to go to this school since right. they were 10 years old. Right. And they're finally there. So it was, it was, the culture is amazing. The, the homecoming is amazing. The history is great. Howard is an amazing school, right? I would take anybody there, mm -hmm. but it was just a lot for me, especially, mm -hmm. you know, going there and having to perform academically, perform athletically, being away from home, being away from my family, all that stuff. It was just a lot at once. Um, granted, I, I mean, I, I like to think I'm pretty open-minded, so I adapted Right. And I, I looking back now, I just you look back to the first year and I was like, OK, like I almost left. But, you know, you just keep pushing. You, you, right. you can't give up this opportunity because of, you know, a little bit of discomfort. Um, so, yeah, that's what I mean by like a culture shock. Yeah, 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 and, for sure. Yeah. And then Americans are just again, they're, they're, they're people just like us, but just the, the black and the African-American culture is very profound, especially on the campus to the point where you have to take. Uh, African American Studies, which is a grad a graduation requirement. Wow! At the okay. school, so they're very, very yeah. It's, they're they're very, very rich in, in their culture and very um, proud of it. Mm -hmm. So it was just like a little bit of a shock for me, and I had to just kind of get up to speed and <laughs> it's off to the races from there. I had no choice. Right, right, right. for sure. W would you have prefer like to get back to it now? Would you have preferred a or? Do you feel like you would have preferred a different area or a different school or at all? No? Never. Yeah. Never. Uh, best decision I've made in my life. For sure. One theme that um, is we've had kind of throughout this whole conversation is kind of 
dealing with expectations, dealing with stress, whether that's in game, uh, you're the captain, so you're kind of put in that position, whether it was moving to Washington, you kind of had to deal with that discomfort. So what we like to ask, especially our guests who are athletes, is kind of the mental game. I mean, just understanding like what you do uh, to kind of manage that. Like what, what are, is it, can you share any of your practices um, or mantras or whatever it is that helps you deal with those situations? Experience has helped me to, to date. I think experience and not really having a choice, but to overcome them Mm -hmm. makes it easier now when faced with certain issues. Um, In terms of in my alone time, I would say with something, you know, kind of goes haywire. And I've been in situations where I've had to, you know, make or been asked to make calls that, you know, really and truly I shouldn't be making, but, you know, just your input is valued. Um, you just kind of, you have to, you have to be very level headed. I would say you can't fly off the handle, but for me, what keeps me calm, I would say I like playing solitaire. So like, I like my phone playing solitaire and even like before games and stuff, I would do that on the bus as I'm listening to my music. Right. Um, but, and, and being in football and I, I do have friends and people that have played at the, the highest level. Um, both men and women that I can always reach out to and, and coaches and, you know, those, those mentors, I guess, those people that kind of drove me to be where I am now that I could always reach out to if I did need, you know, some advice, which has come in handy before and sure. all the power to them. Cause you know, they got me to where I was today. They probably don't even realize it, but they have. Right. Yeah. So, so that kind of wraps up the questions that we had in terms of uh, your professional career and kind of uh, what you're doing and your background we like to always end our podcast with a lighter segment where we do uh, just some quick rapid fire questions. So we'll give you like 10 seconds to answer like four or five questions here. And I swear it's not too crazy. So first off, can you kind of tell us uh, your favorite book or movie of all time? Kite Runner is my favorite book. Ooh, nice, nice. I, I read the sequel. I think it was, it's a sequel, maybe Thousand Splendid Sons. But yeah, love that book too. Yeah, yeah, that one's great. That one's great. That's the, probably the only book i read during like my entire four years in high school so the good. rest was just like spark notes yep. yeah it's so good hilarious all right uh you had a long day whether with work or with coaching um how do you come home and unwind a shower and i might drink a glass of red wine red wine nice which puts me to sleep and then i go to sleep <laughs> awesome okay as long as you weren't gonna say solitaire I was no <laughs> All right. Uh, so you've uh, you've had a chance to kind of live in the States and Canada and St. Kitts. Where would you pick if you had to stay in one of those locations? Canada. Canada. OK. Yeah. I was expecting that. All right. Last but not. Sorry. Go ahead. Or Houston, Texas. OK. What's up with nice. Houston? I just love Houston. I don't know. I've been there a couple of times and it's just one of those places that you go to. And like I went there and I was like, just take a took a breath and it just felt like home i can't explain it i really can't explain it between there i would say seattle too i felt the same way in seattle but seattle's too rainy and i hate their eight so i'll go with it. <laughs> fair all right all right we'll take it we'll take it all right lastly uh this is a food related question that we like to ask everyone do you like pineapples on your pizza no yes Damn. sir that's all right i guess i'm the I, only one i mean we're we're getting pretty even with these that counts now <laughs> we're like um early on like all of our guests were saying yes i'm like shit am i the only one that doesn't like pineapple on pizza but like lately it's all the nose like i mean i prefer without i mean if it's on there like whatever it's on there i may or may not eat it depending on how hungry i am but yeah i would never put pineapples on my pizza i'm a carnivore yeah you guys need (laughs) to expand your palates 